Hello, this is a video about my journey in pub rock. Along the way, I hope to share with you some of my experiences and some of the things I found out during that very exciting time. Because there's so much to say, I'm going to make two videos, one covering the 1970s, this one, and then the next one will cover the 1980s, and then each video will have two parts. You see, it's all very organised, isn't it? The first part will be my recollections of going to venues, and the second part will be my recollection of organising gigs and working in venues. So let's get started. <laughs> What happened was, I was in Chelmsford studying for law and I got voted social secretary of the union and I got involved with putting on gigs and, and going to see bands. This is in 1972, by the way. So then I started to go to London to, to look at bands. A lot of them I saw in pubs, pubs such as, I think the first one I went to was the Lord Nelson in the Holloway Road. Um, I can't remember the band I went to see, I'm afraid, sorry about that. Could have been Fusion Orchestra because that was one of the first bands I ever booked. Could have been Dr. Feelgood, because I saw Dr. Feelgood around that time, though I mainly saw them at the Kensington a bit later on. So let's fast forward. Got kicked out of college because I spent more time watching bands and putting on bands than I did studying law. So then I came to London and I lived in an ashram for the first year or two for Guru Maharaji. I became house father as opposed to house mother. We had both. And that's how I learned to cook Indian food. But that's a different video for another day. The Acton ashram was in Acton of all places. So it meant that I mainly went to places in West London. I know I went to the John Bull in Chiswick. I know I went to I'm trying to think now. I went to the Kensington, and that's where I saw Dr. Feelgood most. And I went to the Nashville. At this stage, can I just say, there's plenty more, so don't think I've um, stopped or anything. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe. You know the drill. Thank you very much. And let's get back to my experiences in pub rock. And the Red Cow in Hammersmith I went to quite a lot. Especially when I worked for a little while when I was at the Astral, I worked at Jay Lyons. And so I went to Hammersmith to the Red Cow, which is just up the road from Brook Green, where I worked doing accounts for canteens, actually, eventually. And not just canteens, but we did the canteens at the Royal Courts of Justice and at Alexandra Palace and places like that. Quite an interesting job, actually, that. Though I, I didn't last... See, in retrospect, I can't believe that I was there for nine or ten months. I can't remember how long. But at that time, it seemed like I was there for years. In 1973, this would be, by then, I would be like 19, so I wouldn't be that old. In my own head, I was still part of the music business, so I was still going to gigs and I was still involved. I put an advert in the Melody Maker, manager of his services, and that was me. I was 19, <laughs> crazy, isn't it? So uh, I went to see a lot of bands, most of whom were older than me. I remember going to see Trevor Evan Jones in his lovely house in Clapham, and we had a very nice meal there, and it was pretty obvious because he'd like, I mean, he'd been in a band that had won the Golden Rose of Montreux and things like that, and he played all over the world. So within about 10 minutes of talking to him, it was obvious that he should be managing me, really, <laughs> rather than do the round. And he's remained a lifelong friend. And this is what, I mean, how many years later? That's like 50 years later. Not bad going, 51 years later, in fact, nearly 52. And I did a little bit of time at Revelations Records, who put out the Glastonbury Fair triple album. I was there putting the album into sleeves and things like that. And I did little things like that around the place. There wasn't a lot happened in the rock and roll world, apart from me going to gigs and the gigs I mentioned. And I was getting a very good appreciation of what type of music was around. And there were people I saw at that time, Dr. Feelgood obviously was so exciting to see. And also, Chili Willie and the Red Hot Peppers, I was really excited. Got here a little picking up sound and then see a little covering ground. Look over there, why do you care? Little this thing all right. The people at Revelations also managed Chili Willie and the Red Hot Peppers. So I saw them a few times, especially at Dingwalls, because there was some connection there, I think, as well. And so I was just getting my feet really because I don't yeah I was as I said I was very young I got into accounts because I was when I first came to London I was at the ashram I was doing cleaning work and I was working for a guy called David who was a high profile cleaning company and all these um, places I went to clean were very posh I mean all in Brompton Row Knightsbridge and Kensington and places like that David Ryder was actually David Ryder Futcher who's an actor by this time, I think he'd stopped giving it all up. He was in Crossroads, the um, low-budget soap opera, for quite a long time, playing a character called Abdullah. So, 
I'm not surprised he packed it in. And also he was, I think, the musical director of the British Music Halls Association. And one of the places I went to was British ambassador to the United Nations. And his wife took an interest in me. And I remember that she got me like clothes so I could go for interviews and arranged for me to go to interviews. and got the London Evening Standard and we went through that. And so I got the job at J Lyons. I literally borrowed a book out of the library on bookkeeping, read it, and then the next day I started work. And then from there, I, I got a job as a assistant chief cashier. Working at this very high-end solicitors in Holborn. It was very old-fashioned. This is in the hot summer of 1976, I can remember. I got that job and I was assistant. I was much better in the rock and roll world where people didn't salute you and call you sir. And from there to working in a pub as a barman in Southall. Again, moved out of the ashram by then. It was a very rough pub, a very big pub, and it put on bands and things. And eventually, cut long story short, I was asked to go into pub management and I trained as a pub manager. Because in those days, it was actually man and wife thing. And I was a single guy. So I was like, um, basically, I was training for pub management. I was basically trained to be the assistant manager, or frankly, a, a fancy head barman. People I was training under, they were running a pub in Chiswick called the John Bull. So they got me to put on the bands in their pub, the John Bull in Chiswick, and that's what I did for quite a long time. Say, it seems quite a long time, but it's probably only a few months. That's how I met people like John Spencer and Johnny G and Donna Gillespie and Supercharge and Red Beans and Rice. And I'm trying to think of all of them. Johnny G, I mentioned Johnny G. And um, so Sam Mitchell and um, Mickey Waller, who was like the drum with Rod Stewart and things, and he used to play with Sam Mitchell and the other people. And I got into this world and I met Bob Kerr of Bob Kerr's Whoopi Band. So, I mean, although he didn't play there, I mean, I used to go and see him at the Eventually went to stay in Bob Kerr's basement for some reason. Can't remember why I was staying there. And it lasted, again, quite a long time. And he didn't like me living in his basement because that was where his studio was. Bob and I went into partnership running an agency and that's how I got into the agency. There's a lot I've missed out. There's a lot where I went to Cambridge. And again, it seems like I was there for a long time, but I can't have been there for that long because it was just after punk starters. That would be like 77. So it's all around the same time. I'd come down to London and I'd been excited by the emerging punk and new wave thing. So I got together a punk club in Cambridge. So I used to come down to London again to watch all the punk bands and go to the Vortex, which was in Crackers, which is in this horrible disco in Wardour Street. And that would be on Monday, Tuesdays. And they put on five bands. It was Dave Woods, so City Entertainment, she used to put them on, who went on to manage Susie the Banshee. So it was one of the bands that played there. And I saw so many bands at like that, and most of them you'd only ever see once. But the people I remember, I remember I saw XTC there back then, it was like a blur. You go to the Roxy, you spend like a couple of hours, because it'd only be like 50 pence or something to get in. So you go to a pub, you think, oh, the Roxy's on the corner, go to the Roxy, watch a couple of bands there. Then you end up at Crackers, and you pay a quid or something. You go in there and you watch two or three bands. And then you go to the pub again. Well, this is like every night of the week, just about. I lived in London and Ely and all the place. So I was like flitting around a lot, and I started this hunk club in Cambridge, the place called the Dog and Pheasant. And that got closed down because somebody got stabbed doing shows at the Cambridge Corner Exchange, which didn't really go down well. But then I started doing gigs at Chancellor Hall Chelmsford, and I was doing a very regular Sunday night night, hunk night, Thursdays and Sundays, I think, I think twice a week, and I was frankly earning, not fortune, but I was earning quite good money, because I was basically booking bands on spec, because I didn't know who anybody was, and also I don't think it really mattered too much then, because it wasn't like there were big stars, you didn't have to put on a very strong bill to get people there, because I was booking people, left, right and centre, using various agents, sometimes it's like, oh there's a band coming over from Ireland, on tour, it's Ireland's biggest punk band, you're going to book them, so I book them, and I'm paying them, not a huge amount, because obviously no one really knows who they are. So I think I was paying the Boomtown Rats £250. But by the time I put them on, they were number two in the charts. And this venue was absolutely rammed. People think that um, Bob Geldof was in charge. He was, he was obviously the dominant character in the band. But all the business stuff was done by the keyboard players called Johnny Fingers. And I realised that if I wanted to have them back again, I couldn't just give them 250 quid and say, thanks, I'll book you again. Which is what most people did, actually, to be honest with you. And I found out why people did that, because I gave them £500, twice what they were supposed to get, 
And you could tell he wasn't very so happy with that. And give us the money now. So let's go forward in time, back to the time when I'm staying in Bob Kerr's basement and working with him on Smart Booking, our booking agency. We were booking out Bob Kerr's Whoopi Band, and I'm doing Trimmer and Jenkins and a few other people, Gino Washington, and Gino had gone to the States and come back again, and he was doing it as Gino Washington Band, I think. He started off doing a heavy metal trio, which didn't work at all. And then people I knew in Putney, the soul band, who were like playing as a soul band, persuaded Gino, who were ex-members of the Ram Jam band, mainly the horns, persuaded him to work with the soul band, but they were paying him. And Gino didn't like this, because um, Gino thought that they were selling his name, which is probably true. And so what happened was, eventually, he persuaded me to work with him as his manager, and to put together other bands. And that's another story for another day. Gino, funny enough, a week or two ago, he was 80. So there you go. There's about 10 things I just realised in my head I haven't mentioned, which are things that, which are just things I did, like the cock in Fulham, the green man in Stratford, helping people out, doing stuff. There was the conflict stuff where I was like doing security. There was a time I worked at Crackers. I did one night there and, and actually ended up like in a situation at comedy. I ended up down the bottom of the stairs and all these people who came in who weren't supposed to get in, there's probably about 20 of them, all basically <laughs> trampled over me when I was on the ground. So you learn things, don't you? And that was, that was my first and last night there. As the man says, I think it was actually Gino who said this, I'm more of a lover than a fighter. There you go. And I'm, and I'm not very good at that either. <laughs> this time I started doing shows at the White Line Putney because it was like a not a secondary place but in there were a lot of music places in the area like there's a half moon where I also occasionally did the odd show there was the Star and Garter where I did shows mainly down in the Citella Bar which held 80 people and I put on comedy there including Ben Elton, Rick Mail and Aid Edmondson and people like that so that was downstairs and then Across the bridge, there was the King's Head in Fulham and all, all types of gigs. And there were various gigs up and down Putney High Street. So there were quite a lot of things happening. So the white line was really only, from my recollection, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I did a lot of stuff like punk. I did anarchist bands like Crass and the Poison Girls and Conflict, a lot of whom I was agent for at the time. Although I wasn't supposed to be agent because the anarchist bands weren't supposed to have agents and manage and things. So, so I was, if anybody asked me, I was a friend of the band, but I used to put on tours and things like that. Friday, Saturday would be somebody like Sam Mitchell or Johnny G or John B. Spencer or Mickey Jope or Do Donna Gillespie or people like that, Ricky Cool. And I did a few rock and roll shows and it was actually the rock and roll that got the White Lion closed down because um, so many people turn up for Crazy Cavern and the Rhythm Rockers that the police who were already over the road because there was a fate going on in the church, um, local police commander was across the road and he saw the disruption to the um, traffic and everything because who knows, I mean, this is the first time ever that Crazy Cavern, I mean, he used to do well, but never anything like that. Turned out the White Line never had a music license. So that's really the end of the 1970s, bringing us on to the 1980s. This may have been 81, 82. I can't remember exactly, because I didn't take notes or write a diary or anything. So that's the end of the first part. Part two, I'll do in a few days. I hope you can stick around, wait for that. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please like, comment, etc., and subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next time. And watch my videos. I've done 200 of these, so not all about pub rock, quite a lot about various small things, my trip to India and things like that. So please watch and support this channel. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>